Hi folks and welcome to my top 10 EU novels of all time. A lot of you have always asked about this uh, since I was doing the series of you know reviewing the entire expanded universe. I said I'll do this after I'm done. Well I am done as of now doing those reviews so now it's time to have a little fun and give you my top 10 list. Now I'll be honest years ago I remember making a top 10 list way back in the day when Lucasfilm wasn't owned by Disney and looking over that list then and this list now some things haven't changed yet a lot some of it still has and I was kind of surprised uh, how I did this is I went through all my books and this was a lot harder than I thought it would be and I had to say which ones that I just really enjoy reading and even I was shocked at this list and don't be angry if your book your favorite book didn't make it on my list um, I may later on do a top 20 uh, after this just because it was so hard but like I said this is all about you know you know just preference I should say uh, my preference is definitely different than everyone else's so and I'll show you with my number 10 my number 10 is Dark Saber by Kevin J Anderson now it's been no secret folks I am a huge Kevin J Anderson fan and have been for years and I'll be honest even though people criticize all of his other writings to be honest Dark Saber is one that most people really uh, adore they really enjoy this one and I gotta be honest I I know why. There is a lot of great stuff here in it. Of course, there's the uh, return to Hoth sequence where they're being hunted down by Wampas. It kind of feels like aliens there. Luke has an awesome scene, battle sequence against the Wampa. Of course, he's fighting. This is all spoilers, by the way. I should mention spoilers the whole way through. But, you know, he's fighting that Wampa with one arm, the, you know, Wampa from Empire Strikes Back, where, so to speak, who's kind of leading the other pack. And I don't know, just overall it felt great. This was also the first time we saw someone from the movies actually die in the novels. And even though it was a small character, you know, General Crix Maydeen, who cares, right? No one thought he was going to die. And I remember I said this in my review that I remember, you know, you said, okay, so what? He got captured. You know he's going to get rescued in the end because no one from the movie, no matter how small the character, will ever die in a novel. Yet, they killed him off and it was just uh, so agonizing too right because as he gets shot through I believe he got shot through the chest or the heart but anyway as he's laying there dying he looks out into the you know the window of this um, ship and he sees the rescue ship the rebellions coming or the new republic's coming to rescue him and then his eyes go black you're like oh my gosh he didn't make it you're like what I remember at first I was like wait he's he's not dead is he yeah! And that was just amazing to me. I'd never seen that happen before. So there's just a lot of great moments in that series. And of course, we got one of my favorite scenes, a uh, Lando Mora connection that they may have had a love interest together, which every fan outright hated. But me, but me. I said, of course she falls for Lando. Everyone falls for Lando, but don't worry. They retconned it and said they were undercover. Yeah, they were. My number nine is going to surprise a few people. It even surprised me when I started making this list. I went, yeah, I think this is a top ten book for me. I love Children of the Jedi. Absolutely love it. Uh, I know a lot of people don't like this one, but Barbara Hamley, I think, knocked it out of the park. Uh, they were dealing with the Luke problem, which means Luke is way too powerful. How do we kind of take him out of the equation here so he just doesn't come in and just solve the whole problem instantly because he's the most powerful Jedi ever? Well, Barbara Hamley did it right because... Over the Eye of Palpatine, he is using the Force so much to break his fall, you know, kind of levitating down the elevator shaft or doing this and doing that. He's finding all these kind of crazy brainwashed aliens who, by the way, there's some hu there's a lot of great humor in there. But at the same time, he's used the Force so much, he is exhausted. And so it really wears him down. He's trying to hold himself together. I remember because he, I think he broke a leg or something like that, but he's trying to hold it together with the force and to keep walking. Well, all of this force usage is really burning him out and make him susceptible to all these, what would be honest, easy threats. You know, they're not that hard. And I thought that was just really a smart move by Barbara Hamley. And I really enjoyed it too. And of course, I'm a Callistia fan. I don't apologize for that. I loved it. I loved it when Callistia survives at the end, the whole body transfer, which to be honest, come on, 
the Emperor tried it in Dark Empire, and it's been tried a couple of the times in Star Wars, so just go with it, right? I don't mind that either. I just I just remember absolutely loving this book, getting up. I, I know I told this story when I was doing the review. I was arm pumping and everything. I was like, yes, 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 because I was one of the maybe, what, three, four people not cheering for Luke and Mara Jade. I thought, no, that's too obvious. Come on, they hate each other, or she hated him for so long that that that, sh that relationship shouldn't work out. It shouldn't work out. Now, I'm happy with it. That's fine. They got married, had kids. That's, that's great. But I was saying, yeah, Callistia, now here's someone that Luke can find. And boom, oof, oof. Fans didn't like that, so they got rid of that. But anyway, Children of the Jedi, for my money's worth, is a great novel, and that's why it's number nine on this list. My number eight is the one and only Timothy Zahn Thrawn Trilogy. Of course it has to be on here. This is the book that got me into the expanded universe, so I have to put it here. Now, I know I've been kind of critical about Zahn here and there, but to be honest, the first trilogy was his best, in my opinion. Thrawn, as we all know, is an excellent villain. He's an excellent art nemesis for our heroes, and it, the story feels like Star Wars. It feels like the original trilogy. It feels like a, you know, a continuation of of the movies, which was very important because if it had a flopped out the gate, there would be no more books. There would be no expanded universe without this trilogy. So, uh, but for me, I think it's also a good trilogy. And I, I still tell people from time to time, if that's where you want to start, that's a great place to start because that's how I started. Uh, absolutely love it. Uh, I, I don't mind that Thrawn died at the end. In fact, I think he should have. I'm glad we got that uh, finality with him. Of course, now, knowing what we know, Timothy Zahn never would have killed him. I think he's even said that never would have killed him off in the trilogy. Would would have had him live forever, and that just wouldn't have been as exciting. I think we love Thrawn so much because he wasn't overused that much. I mean, yeah, he had short stories later on in the past, which we couldn't get enough of Thrawn, but just think about it. If he would have survived, he'd have been in every novel, or most of them going forward after that, as the biggest threat for the Empire. But then he would have been foiled over and over and over again, so he would have lost some of his credibility. So I think it was good that he was in those three big adventures and then that was it. Um, but the Thrawn trilogy, gotta put it in here at number eight. At number seven is the Han Solo trilogy. Which one? Brian Daly's. I absolutely love Brian Daly's. I wasn't expecting much when I read this. I'd heard good things, but I thought it won't be as good as what I'm reading now in the Bantam era. And it was better. <laughs> better than most of the Bandit books I was reading at the time. Uh, I love Blue Max and Bullocks. If you haven't read these, you're seriously missing out. They are solid adventures of Han Solo and a world without Jedi. You know, it's basically just him trying to make his way and somehow pay off Jabba the Hutt. Uh, it's just him and Chewie and then whoever they run across in the three novels. Of course, the droids are with them through that too. And they make the, the uh, what's it called, the comic foil, I guess you should say. They're the ones that throw the jokes in there that you need that humor in there. But at the same time, it feels like Han Solo. I mean, like real gritty, hardcore. And so this is the one where Han Solo is mean. Like He's the guy that... There's that, what, slaver that he just shoots out of the airlock. You know, he kills in cold blood because, hey, back when these books came out, Han shot first. And I love that about Han. I don't mind him being a little cold-blooded before he made all these other friends. With him, it was, you know, some old connections, but they were just mainly business. And then Chewie. Who was his friend? Other than that, he didn't have a family. He had other friends until he got to A New Hope. And so I kind of like this more colder Captain Solo. And Brian Daly just, oh man, he just encapsulated Han Solo's just essence, who he was as a character. And it's just a solid book. I think, I fear this thing gets, you know, tossed away as not that good because it was one of the older books that came out. But to be honest, you've got to read it. Sure, A.C. Crispin's Han Solo trilogy is fantastic. There's nothing wrong with it. But for my money's worth, Brian Daly's is the best. Speaking of old Del Rey novels, I had to put Landau Carician's trilogy in here by L. Neil Smith. Woo! This book, this series of books, made me a Lando fan. Before that, I didn't care about Lando. In my opinion, he was a second-tiered Star Wars character. I didn't really care that much about him. When I bought all three of these Del Rey books, Splinter of the Mind's Eye, uh, Han Solo Trilogy, and Lando Trilogy, I read the Lando Trilogy first because I thought it was going to be the weakest of the three. 
Imagine my surprise when it was the one that I enjoyed more than any of them. Yes, barely. It barely does beat Brian Daly's Han Solo trilogy because it proves that Lando is not just a cheap replacement for Han as he's frozen in carbonite. No, he, he's a rogue too, but he's a more elegant rogue. He, he, he has a silver tongue. He can talk his way out of problems. You know, he can out, he uses his brains and stuff, some of his brawn, even though I will say Han Solo is cunning, but you know, Lando did it with style, and I absolutely love that about Lando Carisi. And Elna Smith does a fantastic job. His droid companion, Vufi Ra, this is back when Lando had the Falcon, which is the only time we hear adventures like that. But it was so much fun, and I've said this in my reviews, there is that joke that he has. Not in every chapter, but in some of the chapters, Lando is trapped and there is no way he can get out. The next chapter, the beginning of the next chapter reads, Sabak. Because <laughs> he got him to play cards. He just weaseled his way out of it somehow. Who cares how he did it? He just did it because he's Lando. And I'll be honest, uh, L. Neil Smith didn't do that joke that much in the series, but I wish he would have done it every time. I seriously wouldn't have gotten tired of it. I thought I laughed every time it happened. It didn't happen that many times, but I wish it would have happened more. But he is the only person, in my opinion, who's ever given, well, not only person, I guess, but he's one of the very few people who've given Lando his 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 time in the sun and really written him well. One of the biggest misses for the expanded universe was Lando was brought in to introduce you know, the newest villain or the newest adventure or the newest mystery, and then he kind of faded to second tier. And this book, of course, puts him at the forefront. He's the star, but it shows that he can carry a book. And he never got his own self-titled novel afterwards, and it's a shame because he really should have. Lando's a great character. L. Neil Smith knew how to write him. And if you have not read these, they're cheap to find, at least the three-in-one paperback. Get it and thank me later. We are in the top five, so here we go. It is Jedi Academy Trilogy. You knew this was going to be on my top ten. I know a lot of people don't like it. I absolutely love it. One of the complaints is, oh, but Luke can't do anything. Luke's so helpful. This is awful. Yes, Luke didn't know what he was doing. He proclaims himself a Jedi Master at the very beginning. Was it a little too early? Possibly. Because, of course, the Academy could not go any worse than what it did, right? I mean, what we know from the actual trilogy and what we know from the Expanded Universe, that first class didn't turn out to be all aces, right? Luke made a lot of mistakes. In fact, in later books, he reminisces how he did make mistakes. When I think it was the... I, it's only, I know you'll correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but I think in Young Giant Knights, when Jason makes the mistake, and or Tentacom makes the mistake and assembles her lightsaber too quick, doesn't Luke talk to her about uh, he had some mistakes when he had first started the Academy that he just can't go back and change, so he's got to accept it and move on and be better? Now, if it wasn't there, it was somewhere I remember reading that, and I thought, hey, that's true, he made his mistakes. Everyone says, oh, he's so stupid, he couldn't figure anything. He was just starting out, and no one had done what he had done in several years, decades even. So there was no Academy, there was no Praxium, you know? So he was kind of starting things off without much help at all. So that, I, that criticism, I just can't get behind. I think the book is great for a lot of reasons. This book gave out a welcoming hand to the comic books. If it wasn't for Kevin J. Anderson's trilogy, who knows if the comic books would have ever been uh, brought into the EU. At this point, they were not officially part of the EU. In fact, you can look at a lot of the Dark Empire stuff and people saying, hey, in the comments, are y'all connected to the Thrawn trilogy? Hey, guys. No. You know, they're doing their own thing. We asked if we are, and they kind of said, no, Timothy Zahn doesn't want to do anything with you. He, don't want to, he doesn't want anything to do with the comic books. He kind of, you know, stuck his uh, nose out at the comic books. But Kevin Jenner's like, sure, man, we'll bring y'all in. Come on, I'll write your adventure in here. And then he started tying in Tales of the Jedi and everything. And to be honest, he did a, this trilogy did a lot. It also invented the double-bladed lightsaber. Now, Kevin J. Anderson, just like a bunch of other authors, got a thank you letter from George saying it was a great book. Did he read it? They don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But either way, we know George knew about that because he borrowed that and put it in episode one. The double-bladed lightsaber came from Kevin J. Anderson. That was one of his contributions, as well as Timothy Zahn naming the planet Coruscant. That came from George Lucas saying, hey, I like that. So obviously he skimmed through it 
to know that, but I, I'd like to think he did at first was reading f through them at the very beginning, then in the late 90s kind of stopped. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's in the Jedi Academy. I love Kip Duran. Of course, he's my favorite EU character. Um, I was his age when I was reading this, so I, that that's another thing that really bought, brought me into it. I was like, oh, I could be Kip Duran, and who doesn't want to be friends with Han and Chewie and fly across the galaxy and then grow up like that, right? Go into the academy, get tempted by Exar Kun because your brother, you know, is, is is trapped. You want to save him. You want to do you do bad things to get good deeds done. It's a twisted way of thinking. But that's how you turn people to the dark side. And you know, all of a sudden, Han and Chewie's little buddy is now destroying <laughs> billions of lives, and he's kind of dark Jedi now. And so it also brought Han a little bit into this world of the Force that he doesn't really understand. And he's not trying to use the Force, he's trying to appeal to Kip from when he first met him in the Spice Mines of Kessel. I'll be honest, I don't see anything wrong with this. I don't think the Sun, I mean, sure, the Sun Crusher's overpowered, but that's what the Empire is all about, is super weapons, okay? Totally impenetrable, Matt, can destroy, you know, entire star systems. Yeah, but then we have Episode Seven, so shut up, okay? It's already been done on a much bigger scale. Uh, so for me, Jedi Academy Trilogy is where it's at. Absolutely love it. My number five. At number four is a series that I think everyone would have on their top ten if they did this, but it's going to be the X-Wing Rogue Squadron series by Michael Stackpole. It's got to be Stackpole. When I first saw these, I was like, wait, so no Han, no Leia, no Luke, no thank you. I mean, I'll buy it because Bantam's coming out with it, but I'm not expecting big things here. Ooh. Ooh. The very first book pulled you in, right? And you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, you knew who Wedge was. You knew he was the pilot that survived all three movies. But other than that, you didn't really know about him. Michael Stackpole created a background and character for Wedge that everyone fell in love with. Dennis Lawson, the actor, would not be, no one would know his name if it wasn't for those books. I know he probably rolls his eyes and I had nothing to do with the books. Yeah, but you better be thankful for him because that's why more people want your autograph than normally would. I mean, I'll be honest. I want his autograph because <laughs> I think Wedge is so cool because of the series. And Michael Stackpole was the first one to take none of the big characters. Sure, they make guest star appearances here and there, but none of the big characters are in his book. It's just about X-Wing pilots. And you cared about every single one. Every single one. They were like family to you. And then, of course, any one of them would die. And you're like, oh my gosh. I mean, those were some hard books to read. Some hard books to read, right? But they were fantastic. Hard, I mean, because, you know, some of your characters would die. You're like, oh my gosh, I don't know who's going to live. You think Wedge would be all right, but everyone else, you, you may like them. They may last one mission. They may last several and then eventually die. He said he wanted to build the experience much like pilots in World War II had with, with their squads. And he did, in my opinion, that four book series, a quadrology or whatever you call it, not a trilogy, was something a little different we hadn't seen before. So I really, my hat's off to Michael Stackpole. He did a fantastic job. I, I do think his X-Wing books are his best ones he ever did. But man, man, if, if that was all that he gave the EU, he would still be in my top 10 here at number four. Now, folks, this is cheating a little bit, but number three is, again, the X-Wing series written by Aaron Alston. Now, on any given day, I could switch Stackpole with Alston or Alston with Stackpole any given day. In fact, this list switch, switches back constantly. I couldn't decide. So I flipped a coin. I picked with Alston because he did something even more amazing. Because after Stackpole had made all these X-Wing pilots cool, Austin comes in, you're like, no, I don't want the substitute teacher, I want the real deal. But then he comes out with, I'm not doing Rogue Squadron, I'm doing Race Squadron. Well, I really don't care about the B Squad, right? And then you love it even more, or just as much as the other X-Wing books. So he had a he had it even harder, in my opinion, because he had a high bar to meet with Stackpole, but he met it, sometimes maybe exceeded it, because I'll be honest, there, even though Stackpole has humor in his books, Austin was master of his humor. You laughed more at the Race Squadron series than Rogue Squadron. I guarantee you did. And, to be honest, Iron Fist is the only book to make me tear up. I mean, there's some sad moments in here, but Iron Fist got me choked up. I was like, no, a pretend character just died. I mean, you, just, you get, because you're so tied into these characters. It is brilliant. And for that reason, I think that's why he's going to be a solid number three. Again, you like Sackpole better, you're not getting any argue, argument from me. But for me, Austin, 
Whew, I mean, sell it. I should say that things like Asarda's Avenge for Stackpole is great, and Starfire's The Undo Mar for Austin is great too. Those are great too, but those first series, man, with the Race Squadron, a brand new team. He focuses on Kale, what, Tainer, the first book, and then after that, he becomes a side character. Like, what? So that's not the guy we're following now? And, and then, of course, so many deaths at so many different times. Austin filled in Stackpole's shoes perfectly and actually exceeded. Uh, his predecessor just a little bit just in the way he wrote. So that's why Austin's X-Wing Trilogy is my number three. At number two is what a lot of people would put at number one, but it's Legacy of the Force. I, I love it for all the reasons everyone talks about it. I do think that Invincible by Troy Denning, the way it ended, is one of the best books in the EU. There's no doubt about that. I loved how they uh, reinstituted uh, the cheesy jokes from Young J. Knights at the beginning of each chapter. You knew what was going to happen. You knew how it was going to end. But yet you're like, oh man. And you have to steal yourself because when I read that first joke, I was like, what is it? Oh, I remember those days when they were kids. They were kids. And if you think about it, in the Young J. Knights books, they did face off unknowingly. And they put down their swords, never to raise their swords together again. They were tricked right by the Sith Academy. But now they're doing it for real this time. And everything, you know, they're no longer kids anymore. And all that, you're thinking, oh my gosh, this is really happening. And it was just an epic ending. But the whole series as a whole, it is really good. There's a lot of great stuff going on. There's a lot of other great story arcs. I've already reviewed this entire series. And while people put it number one, I totally understand that. Especially if something like Young Jedi Knights got you into the series, which a lot of those people did. They started with Young Jedi Knights. And then I understand. Legacy of the Force is probably the creme a la creme, right? Of the whole storyline for you. I get that. And I agree with you. It is an excellent series, but it remains a solid number two on this list. Because folks, you know what number one is. I didn't hide it in my reviews. I dressed up for it too, changed my intro for it. It's New Jedi Order. Folks, when I read New Jedi Order, Vector Prime, my, my brain, I think I told you this, was leaking out of my ears. I was so shocked at what I was reading. I'd never seen anything like that. The books matured. They, they, not only did they keep the continuity, but they sowed the continuity like no one else did. Better than Bantam. Bantam would just say, hey, remember when we did this? And that was their continuity. Oh, just recalling the past adventures. No, Delroy goes, okay, because of this, this happens. Because of this from Show the Jedi, Lord Nyx happens. Anyway, there is so many epic moments in this. So many epic moments to just point out. And it's just, it's really a flawless series. I know one of the complaints about people goes, oh, it was too long. No, I'll be honest, they could have doubled the number of novels and I still wouldn't be saying that. Every new, I mean, seriously, to me, that was the pinnacle for me for uh, Star Wars, because every book was coming out connected, deeply connected to the other one, bringing, sewing in so much continuity, bringing back all, just about every character from Bantam came back for this. It was everything you've dreamed of. It's Empire Strikes Back the entire way into the last two novels, when finally I think no one dies. You're like, oh, what's going on here? But it is just incredible. It's incredible. Sure, it doesn't have the strong ending, I think, as Legacy of the Force does, but I think it just overall has a stronger storyline. There are even, or you know, I wouldn't say failed storylines, but uh, storylines that weren't continued that were just interesting. I, I've mentioned this before, but 3PO watching the sparks fly as the Falcon's getting worked on, sparks fly off the Falcon from this tool and falling to the ground and disappearing. The embers kind of fizzing out as they hit the concrete. And he's thinking, he's contemplating what life is like. And you're like, what? And there was supposed to be a, a, a side story about droids, because you know, droids were the ones being attacked by the Vong. The Vong, what a great idea. Don't, I'm, I'm glad Lucasfilm or George said, no, don't do Dark Jedi. You can't do Dark Jedi. And they got more creative, which was great. I think if they'd have done Dark Jedi, it would, I know it wouldn't have been as good. It wouldn't have been as good. An outside threat that or you can't feel in the force, they're a problem for the Jedi, they're a challenge to the Jedi, and they don't involve the Force. I like that. I really like that. Uh, so a skilled fighter and a Jedi have the same, you know, uh, what was it, chances on beating a Vong. 
it kind of evens the playing field in a, in, in, like that. And that the Vaughn were just so dominant. And I thought the whole series as a whole was really scary, man. It was really scary. I think Kathy Tires, when she wrote Balance Point, said, you know what? The Vaughn really scared me. The more I got into their mind, the more I thought about it, they're a scary race. I was like, yeah, they are scary, man. Oh, there's another one, Balance Point, when Jason finally becomes a man, right? And does that big giant force push. There's just a lot of great moments in Nuja Order. I mean, just countless, too, too many to count there. And I mean, even Kip Duran kind of being the villain a little bit there. I like that too. Everything, everything, except for that awful Dark Horse miniseries that came out afterwards is great about New Jail Order, but this is about the novels too, so that doesn't even count in this in this list here. But New Jail Order, my number one. Folks, let me know in the comments, what are your top 10? And I will see you next time with another video.